Lauren Snell here and welcome back to High Intensity Business, your one-stop shop for elevating your hip business and fueling your passion for high intensity training. Before we dive into today's episode, grab your free PDF guide on how to turn your hip business into a robust referral machine. You can download that now over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref, that's R-E-F short for referrals. And you'll also get a full length video training with Luke Carlson on how to build a referral machine and get access to lots of free resources, including hip business guides, checklists, and much more. Just go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref, that's R-E-F short for referral. So today, this is episode 419, and today we're going to be talking to Jeff Turner from Imagine Strength. Jeff is the owner of Imagine Strength, or the sorry, the co-founder of Imagine Strength, and the um, owner of Abstract Bodyworks Precision Exercise, a hit studio business with four locations. Really excited to talk to you today, Jeff. Thanks so much for making the time to come onto the podcast. I love love being here. Appreciate it. And as we were saying before we got recording, I love the fact that you're sat on the the Imagine Leg Press, couldn't think yeah. of a better place for you to record podcast. So I thought before we get started, I just want to really tell the listeners or the viewers, um, I did actually record several podcasts with your colleague, uh, Clay Steffi, amazing mm-hmm. podcast. I was so thrilled to be able to do with him on his journey in the kind of exercise machine world and all the, you know, his time with like Nautilus and Medex and Exobotics and obviously now Imagine. So we've like really, you know, um, documented that journey, which is great. Uh, and the last one we did, which is episode 372, was a podcast on Imagine. So we might duplicate some information in this, this episode, but I'm not really concerned about that. I think we're still going to produ- provide a lot of value here and information on Imagine. Um, but if you want even more information, we did a full-length article and a podcast with Clay on Imagine over at episode 372. Um, and I'll actually link that from the blog post over at highintensitybusiness.com in this this episode. So the blog post for this one is 419. So just uh, keep that in mind if you really want to go deep on Imagine, you want to consume all of these resources. So Jeff, let's uh, start from the beginning. How did you get into high intensity training and, and talk to us about that? I'm going to try to keep all this short because it can get very boring. <laughs> unless, unless you've gone through the same thing I that I it. have, you know. But over the years, you know, I used to be the bodybuilder back in, when I was 18 years old. I wanted to be as big as I, I could be. So I started the two hour a day, six days a week workouts. You, know, you had to do that then. I got my first muscle bag when I was 16 years old, was Arnold on the front. You guys probably have these. If you guys look back in your old archives, you probably have these um, old muscle um, fitness or, you know, muscle builder uh, Ironman magazines. But um, I had to have, I had to have them to go work out. You know, so I started working out when I was about 18 years old, really. And I was a farm kid, so I always had halfway decent genetics. I grew up that way, you know, and I wanted to be stronger and, and get, of course, bigger for the mirror, you know. So I went in there and started doing that. And I made some good progress over the years, but, you know, we believe that's what we need to do. I spent two hours a day, six days a week. It was a lot of, lot of time. Well, the guy that trained me there, and we got our first line of Nautilus, Chrome Nautilus in, in there. They actually charged extra to use that equipment. It was very good uh, for their business, but I'd never seen Nautilus, but I'd heard of it. Well, this guy took me through my first, he goes, you got to try this. He goes, oh, I said, no, come on. You know, that's for women. I mean, this is in my mindset. I, I know a lot of us had that mindset back then. And I said, okay, but okay, I'll try it. By the time I was done, I found out what intensity was versus volume. And I thought I was strong. I thought I was in good shape. I about died. I mean, I didn't really about die, but you know what I mean? You, you, you know that feeling, you're, you're collapsing. You're, you're, you're fit, you know what failure really is. You got holy smokes. From that point on, I kid you not, from that point on, he gave me a Nautilus book. I read everything I could find from Darden, um, even Westcott, but mainly Darden and Arthur Jones starting off. And I was like, holy moly, this makes sense. Wow. And that's what happened. So I started doing Nautilus training after that. And then I just had to go to Nautilus. I had to fly down and I flew down to Florida and, and met with um, Darden, which actually the first person I met was Jim Flanagan. And Jim Flanagan, I'm going to plug him pretty well, because Jim Flanagan is one of the nicest, most honest people you'll ever meet. That guy will look you straight in the eyes and you'll know where you stand with him. He will never, he will never sell you wrong. I mean, he's just that kind of guy. And he met me right out front at Nautilus. And, it, and from that point on, he was so good. He set me up in a training with um, Darden to come back. And I went back and then he turned me on to, um, I met with Darden. And here's a little side note real quick. You guys will love this. I got in there 
I was a natural bodybuilder. I got in there with Darden and he goes, stand up. He goes, turn around. He goes, all right, you can sit down. He goes, on a scale of one to 10, you're a six. <laughs> and I go, you know, all of a sudden you just kind of collapse, you know, in front of him because you're a six. He goes, maybe a seven in a couple areas. I'm, you know, he, but that was one of the most yeah. important things that I ever learned. And it was really important. And the reason why, because I went back and reevaluated what I was doing. I'm not going to be Mr. America. I'm not going to be Mr. Universe. I got good genetics, but I won't take steroids. I won't take human growth hormones. I'm not going to do that. So I reevaluated what I was doing. I went back to change my thought process and why I was training. And we started going after age defying exercise. Um, ideas about how do we stop the body from losing muscle mass, bone, joint strength, and, you know, what's affecting us as we age, those kind of things. Yeah. But then, then what, how did you then get into sales for Nautilus? When did that happen? Well, after from that, by the way, Darden got, he, you know, he'd been, he'd been uh, seeing so many people. This is right before they, they went to MedEx. It was just the last year of him being in the office. And he turned me on to Ken Hutchins. Ken Hutchins turned me on to Super Slow. I went into high intensity slow training, which I love. I, I made, made so much sense to me. Well, I got to know more and more of the people at Nautilus. The guy out here that ran, um, um, the, it's called Proline, he ran the Northwest Territory for Nautilus, was named Roy Musgrove. Uh, we went to buy equipment. I just couldn't train at the clubs around here anymore. I, I went in there. I just could not train. You know, you guys, we all have gotten through this. You look at it and you're going, I got to get out of here. So this is one reason why we, most of us buy and build studios. is because we want to do it for ourselves. <laughs> yes, sir, uh, fairly, you know, and, and make money with it. But the nice part is yeah. we get to do it for ourselves. So that's what I did. I built, a, um, I ended up having 27 pieces of Nautilus grid at my house. Oh, wow. So I had a huge studio at home. I bring people home to see my own home gym. And if I were coming home to see a bench and some dumbbells, and I, you walk in, I had 27 pieces lined up inside my you know, so studio at home. So oh, very good. that's where I started. Okay. And then how did that segue into you being a salesperson for them? Well, from that, they, um, Roy got to know who I was and got that body equipment from him. He understood that, wait a minute, you, you have, and don't get me wrong, I'm, try, I'm not boasting myself up. I had a huge degree of knowledge on the mechanical side and on, on the physical side as far as training from Ken Hutchins and Ellington Darden. They taught me a lot. I'm, I'm not the guy that went out and created any of this. I learned from my mentors. You know, I can suggest to anybody, find some good mentors. They will bring you up through this. That will make a huge difference in your business and who you are. And I learned from, from PhDs. Dr. Wayne Westcott's a good friend of mine. Um, Jim Flanagan taught me tons. And, you know, taught me a lot, but you yeah, got Ken Hutchins on Darn. So I, at that point in time, Roy said, you know, have you, where do you want to be in five years? And I was working at a can manufacturing plant. I, I worked as a machinist mechanic on, on equipment at this can manufacturing plant. Well, it piqued my interest. I'm going, oh, what do you mean? And, you know, and then he asked me, well, I think you could be really good at sales, but here's what you're going to have to do. Forget everything you know, because they don't. People do not understand. I'm going to, I'm going to use some of this throughout this. I think it's extremely important for all of us that are in this industry. We need to learn and understand sales. We understand the physical aspect. We forget about what that person's coming in our door. That's the hardest thing to do is to come in our door. And by the way, I'm sitting in my studio, so I'm pointing at, I'm pointing at my door. For, for them to walk in that door, it takes a, a huge amount to them to be able to do it. So Roy says, you got to forget all you know about exercise equipment. You need to ask them about what there's problems are and provide solutions to that. And we all know this stuff, but we forget to ask it, who, what, where, why, when. So he asked me about that. And I, I, I ended up quitting 15 year business or uh, a career at candy manufacturing to go into novice um, sales. And the first three months were extremely tough. Let me tell you what, I uh, out went broke because I did not understand the sales aspect, but I learned. And once I started getting it, um, we took a territory that was doing 300,000 a year at 2.4 million. In less than two years in knowledge just not on sales that's amazing yeah I, I agree completely and i'm just curious what were uh what was the um sales process like when selling nautilus because i reading stuff you've wrote on your linkedin and and what i've seen online i like the fact that you're, talk, you're always talking about okay yes it's a great machine they help you you know strength train people etc but you always speak to and you do this obviously with imagine as well which is clever um, which you're speaking to, well, how does this, what's the business benefit here? You know, it's, yeah. it's producing, it's retaining clients, it's, pro it's making the studio more profitable. And I'm curious when you, I mean, maybe you do it now, I've imagined, but what, what is, how, how do you make, how do you talk about 
the machines that they're meaningful to the end user, to the customer. Well, what's really interesting, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because really the the key going in is you sit outside their. I would sit outside a, a gym or a studio, and there were times I'm, I would leave. I kid you not, I would leave with a proposal after first meeting a guy after an hour. You'd walk in there, they weren't thinking about buying, but you go in there and you ask them, you know. And, and if I were coming to you, Lawrence, I would say, Lawrence, let me ask you a question. You know, seventy two percent of all buying decisions, and this, this is true, especially in the United States, are done by women. They're done by the women in the family. They're pulpy. I said, how are you making your club? What are you doing to make your club more effective, more attractive to women? And they look at you like, they never thought about that. I said, we need to attract them. They'll attract everybody else. And so we had a line of Nautilus for women. We designed smaller frames at Nautilus. And so from that, we showed them how to make money with the equipment. Not not about the results. They knew Nautilus. They know about Nautilus cams. They know Arthur Jones at that point in time. We're talking, you know, late 80s, early 90s. And that was still a big, Nautilus was still a really a big deal. And I mean, I, I believe Nautilus blue and brown. I mean, you cut me, I'm going to believe Nautilus blue. I still <laughs> love Nautilus. I have Nautilus trucks. I mean, I mean, I, I love Nautilus. But, but that was the whole point of going in there was to help them make money. We created five different programs, senior fitness, corporate fitness, pregnant, uh, prenatal, post-prenatal. And then we had them on disc. You need that to help sell that equipment. Use, oh, use okay. your studio. Yeah, so we pr provided programs for the equipment. Okay. And then, and then, so obviously you had a successful career there. And then, and then you went into obviously starting your own studio business with Abstract Body Works. Yeah. Um, so how did that come about? Well, as we got through the, as we got through the, my Nautilus career, unfortunately from, I did about 11 years and I just, we, and people know this, but, uh, Nautilus got bought out by Direct Focus, which is uh, Bowflex, you know, Bowflex company. And they, they were right here near me in Vancouver, Washington. And I would stop by and see them. But the, we had differing opinions of what Nautilus was. Um, there's a really good book out called The Other Guy Blinked. And I believe that that's what's happened with our industry. Um, we, we have forgotten who we are and what we're going after. And this is going to segue into why we built Imagine, okay? And Nautilus Equipment, as far as I'm concerned, Nautilus Medics, they were the cat's meow. They're the best. And the reason is because of the design features around muscle and joint function, the, the 10 requirements for range exercise that Arthur came up with in the first place. And so I'm pretty much an Arthur person. I mean, not everything Arthur ever did was correct. I'm not saying it is, but I'm telling you what, he changed the face of the industry and how we train. And I believe in it because it makes logical sense. And that's what we did with um, Nautilus. Nautilus, when Drug Focus bought us, it, it was all about, I told you, I mean, we did 2.4 million in sales. I was doing about 110 to 140 thousand dollars a month of sales. They wanted me to, to put out 10 times the proposals and close 10 percent. My closing ratio was about 85 percent. Why would I want to work that hard to get 10 percent closing ratio? I had to leave. We, we we lost focus of who we were, and Nautilus was no longer about um, concept of training, and that's where Nautilus came from. If you look at one other road, it was all about how you exercise correctly. Then you build your tool. Then you build it. And that's what we did. That's what we're doing with Imagine. What we've learned over the years, you know, we, you, you throw it into the equipment. That's, you, can't, you can't design a cam for an engine without specifically designing it around the most effective and efficient way to get gas mileage and power out of it. Well, the same thing with their equipment. You want to build it around a certain protocol, how you train. You don't have that, which most companies do not. They don't care how you train on it. Um, then I don't know how you design your, your, your pro string profiles or anything else that we're doing. So this is where it all came from. Yeah. Awesome. Sure. So interesting. Um, and then, okay. So then you, you became disenfranchised with Nautilus and then started yeah. your own business basically at that point. And you've been doing that for like 23 years. It looks like at least. Yeah. I think it's 23 or 24 years now. You know? Yeah. 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 And we, That's I have a, if I took you on a tour, all the Nautilus guys would, be, would love it. Cause I've got, I've got a lot of old Nautilus clear back in the seventies, but I've rebuilt it, changed the cam profiles, um, put bearings in them, blow friction them and all that. Because they're good tools and they still work. Well, Jeff, you know, obviously I've had the good fortune of getting a little tour of your studio last time we spoke on Zoom. Um, but it'd be great if you didn't mind, I wouldn't mind of just shooting a video, maybe and just sending it over after the fact. And we'll just embed it in the, the blog post so people can actually see some of your amazing equipment you have in your studio. Yeah, I mean, if we can, right before we're at the end, I can walk, you know, we can walk through. Yeah, that's a good have... idea. Let's do that if we have time at the end. That's a great, great idea. 
Um, okay, so let's talk about imagined strength. Um, although before that, I, I, I have to ask you about this because you just kind of like subtly dropped in an email to me once about a near-death experience you had. Was that during the, the uh, uh, the, was, was that whilst you were starting Imagine or is that before? What was the unique experience? The near-death experience you said you oh, had. Yeah. You said you nearly death. died twice. So, you know, I've, I've worked out since I was 18. I've, I've maintained you know, pretty much proper health as much as I can. I don't eat perfect because I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, I'm you know, 15 <laughs> to 20 pounds, you know, I'm 15 to 20 pounds over fat. I, you know, especially during the, all the pandemic stuff, you know, you, half the fun you have is finding something to eat, you know, and sitting around and enjoying a meal with, your, <laughs> with my wife because we couldn't do anything else. Well, that said is 14 years ago, I was feeling pressure and, and pain in my chest. I could not figure it out. I, I, I don't have high cholesterol. I never had high cholesterol or anything like that. I don't have diabetes. Well, it got bad to the point where I took myself very quickly in, into a cardiologist. And the cardiologist goes, well, you, you're in good health. I can't see anything. He said, I need you to go and look. Because I don't, I don't, there's something going on. And sure enough, he went in. He didn't believe me. I had to call, I had to go in three days early at emergency because it got so bad that um, the, the pain was going across. And going, I never had short wrist of breath, never had any issues like that. Just the pain. I had a 95% blockage in the blood clot inside my heart. I had wow. two of them, two of them. And so I had a two stents put in at that point 14 years ago. And they basically, I saved my own life. I didn't have a heart attack. I didn't have any damage in my heart. Luckily, I felt, the, I felt it. So 14 years later, they had me down now. Understand my cholesterol now has been around 100 for the last 14 years. So low that it's almost important. My joints hurt. My leg hurts all the time, right? So... I felt pressure again in a different area and pain coming up into my throat. How weed eating. I could not believe it. So I went in and grabbed two nitro and took myself to the uh, ER. Guess what? 90% blockage in another artery. Wow. With, and one above it. I clogged up. And this is why people need to understand when you're, if you're listening to this podcast, please understand you don't ignore things like that because even though all the indicators show that you, you don't have an issue, my, in my family, my, my, my family, our, our men especially, they clog up for some reason. You just got to be aware of some of those things. You just get them checked. Because I tell you, I saved my life myself twice. I just about died. Well, I'm the last one. I was within two weeks of being dead. Well, that's incredible. So was that mostly, sounds like that was mostly genetic probably? Or yeah. Like, yeah, it's yeah. a genetic it's a genetic predisposition that I have for some reason. You know, somewhere in my arteries, are, they're creating ridges. And, it, and that my body's trying to protect itself and smooth those things out. Well, it builds up a bunch of plaque, and, but it's at a hundred total cholesterol at hundred. My triglycerides, by the way, are very low. So why am I doing it? I don't know, but it, I'm that outlier that, you know, doesn't necessarily fall in that, um, 80% curve, you know, and oh, well. that's a problem that people need to be aware of. They need to understand that just get checked. That's the, don't, don't put it out. Cause you could, you know, I could have been dead within two weeks. And by the way, right after that, because I felt pressure. So this is why I sent twice. I collapsed at home. I put, uh, I thought I was having pain in my back. Or I was having pain in numbers. Now, this is only two days after I got back out of the hospital. Well, I took a nitro, went to bed, and it just, the pain didn't go away. Normally, it will. Take a nitro, it's gone. If you have any issues with your heart, it would go, because it opens and dilates the arteries. I see. Pain. Well, I stood up. We were going to go and get checked. Just at 10 30 at night, I completely collapsed. Heart, heart weight and blood pressure went down to 60 over 30. I was another, I was getting what they call, He's getting his angel wings. Well, what happened was, is they kept me on this medication that was a beta block, which they should never have put me on. My heart rate's never above 50, hardly. And this is why they didn't think I had an issue. Well, they were giving this beta block. And then I took a nitro. Well, it dropped my blood pressure so low so quickly. And when I stood up, I collapsed. I was gone. I was gray. And my wife thought I was dead. And so that was two days after the stents. So this whole last year, has been rough. And then, you know, later on, I, I moved all 30 some pieces of equipment, lined them all up, and I ended up destroying my uh, L3. I had to go on for back surgery. I was in a wheelchair for four, four months last year. Oh, wow. Jeez, I couldn't even stand. Through. Could not yeah. stand. I had to work on the equipment on the floor when I was doing stuff. I mean, the tough way I was doing some Just get items. clay to lift them all, Jeff. What's, you know, what's just get yeah, clay yeah. to lift them all. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, and, and then I lost my dad in October. He, he passed oh, away. So it's just been a, it was a rough year last year, but this is how you persevere, right? There were a number of times, I kid you not, Lawrence, a number of times where I wanted to just give up, just quit. It was just so hard to get through all this, but um, 
I had a lot of people around me going, no, 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 no. Even my partners in, at the factory, they, no, this, they've never built equipment like this. They've never seen anything like it. They're extremely impressed with what we're able to show them and do. And so they're very much behind what we're doing. I mean, this is why we're able to do, we can get equipment out so quickly. Anyway, we'll get to that factory. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Well, I think we're all grateful that you managed to pull through and continue on with rough. this mission because... I mean, it gives you so much meaning. If anything is going to pull you through, it is going to be this, I think, you know. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it's the, that's the great thing about having like really big, meaningful pursuits is they, they, they make the, the tough parts of life easier to, to persevere with and get through. You know, it ended up being now that it kind of ended up being a, it's my legacy in a sense. You know what I mean? I right. want it to be, I don't want it to be necessarily overblown, but I want people to remember that even whether you like it or you don't like it, that's okay. That. You know, I tried to do something and I did it. I got it done. That's my main thing. Is people kept going, how are, you, how are you getting this done? I said, I don't know. I told mm -hmm. but it just keeps falling into place and we keep pushing forward. So. Fair play to you, Jeff, as they say in Ireland. Um, so tell me, uh, let's, I mean, obviously there's people tuning in who might know nothing about Imagine Strength. So we should give them the high level overview of the business and the product set. So okay. take it away. Well, basically, you know, uh, Imagine Strength, of course, is selectorized equipment with weight stacks. And what we've gone through having the Nautilus, and mainly what I use Nautilus Super Slow Medics equipment in my studios. And going through all of those and, and setting up people, a lot of, most of my um, abstract, most of our people that we have are 55 and above, up to 103. And we trained those, you know, to say we have a 103 year old. Yeah. Well, we did. <laughs> not, not anymore. We did. Oh, uh, but yeah, we did. Apologies. Um, okay. But I have a number that are over 90, you know, and, the, and it, of course, the key is that they need to be strong. Strength is youth. Without strength, you're, you're, you're frail. You can be frail and, and fat. You can be frail and skinny, but you cannot be frail and strong. You cannot be strong and frail. So you choose to be strong, right? So that's who we are. Well, imagine has come. I can still remember. I got it written down. At, um, I was sitting at Epcot Center five years ago. And I sat there and I'm going, thinking about a name because I wanted to design my own line of equipment. I want to get into a line of equipment because nothing's being built and changed or nothing new is going to be coming out for us. I'm talking about not new cardio, not new treadmills. Not, I mean, for us to use on the floor in a studio to help, help you make money. Basically, that's what it was. Get in, get out, get people in it and train them you know, and make some money without breaking the bank. And I was in on a number of different projects that have out there with different electronic equipment stuff. So I've seen all of that. I was part of it. I had some pieces here as a prototype, but the main focus that I wanted to do, imagine, was to build a line of equipment that fit what we do and help people make money with it. And that's kind of where it came from. And so I came up with Imagine, so need to have God going, well, imagine strong, imagine money or profit, imagine, you know, Youth, imagine whatever. I figured with imagine, it makes sense to logically be able to use imagine, imagine strength. And that's kind of falls wherever you want to use as a marketing tool for it. It was just a, a name that fit for me. So that's where imagine came from, is we wanted to design a line of equipment, good tools, um, perfect tools, no such thing. You know, you know, I'm going to admit it. Just like Arthur used to say, he goes, look, I could build, design a much better tool and much uh, more correct a piece of equipment you can't get in or get out of it you can't use it but you can design one and that's true I, i've gone through that with this you know we 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 designed equipment or muscle and joint function proper you know 10 requirements of four range exercise and with clay clay knows that stuff very very well he's got quite a pedigree quite and <laughs> quite a pedigree and we've gotten and we go back and forth so i'm kind of the uh um you know he's the design tool i'm kind of the guy that that's uh, sees it, you know what I mean? So I go to him and say, we need to do this. Or, But I mean, he knows joint function. He knows how to, you know, and I, and I bring in the strength curves, you know, I bring in, no, we need to have it like this, because this is who we train, you know? So from our training, the people that we see comes the, the design of you, what we need. And here's the thing, Lawrence, we're never done. I mean, one thing we'll, we will always do, I, I do not want to be some of the other companies have done, and that is just sit back, sit on your hands, and say, okay, I'm done, I'm done. Do, if we can massage the equipment, make it better, each iteration, each time we build one, we'll make it just a, a little bit better, you know? And that's what you do. You don't, you know, this is a community effort. You, me, everybody out there, um, even even using Discover Strength and looking at them. Um, we've had some things that we've done for them specifically to change the equipment because this is what they wanted. 
Now, it'll make the equipment better, won't it? Yeah, yeah. because we have community yeah. effort. Yeah, I mean, I just, you're making me, you're reminding me of uh, that short conversation we had. Um, I think I was just after my early morning workout at the resistance exercise conference. So I probably was in great company and I was exhausted. But you're uh, trying, yeah, I remember now. Oh, I was, I was, you know, the listeners will be sick of hearing this, but I was uh, hung over as usual for the uh, early morning workout, which is never a good idea. And one of these, one of these years I'll learn. Um, and uh, just went through the workout and then I was walking back down the line and then I bumped into you and I just said to you, like, I, I love the machines. I had a great workout and I was, we were talking about a few of them and you're, you're like really bad at taking a compliment, Jeff, because you were just, your immediate response to me was like how you're improving it. Right. <laughs> so like you, like you were just saying there, like what you're iterating, you were telling me like, oh, that one over there is version seven and that's version four and we got to change this. And I love that. I love that mindset. It's like a growth mindset, right? You're always looking to improve. Like Kaizen. Because exactly. I don't you know, I don't have all the answers. I, I never yeah. said I, this is not about Jeff Turner or anything to do with that. I'm not trying to promote myself at all. I don't there are a lot of people out there, unfortunately, in our industry that that's what they want to make a name for themselves. I do not. I want to make a legacy tool that makes sense. Like you look real honors have such fond memories of Donald's, especially in the eighties, seventies and eighties. You know, I'm old as you can tell. I mean, with the white hair. And you look at the 70s, 80s, those were some absolutely fun times. I mean, I learned so much. I have, you should see how many books I have been written by, you know, multiple different people from Darden to, you know, Westcott. And I've learned so much from them. But it was fun times because it was all kind of new. Well, then we forgot it all. I don't know what's happened. So we took steps backwards a few years ago. And you, we all remember what this is. And I, don't, I won't get into why. And we know where it's coming from. But we took multiple steps backwards. Instead of us creating um, better tools and, and more proper training, we created stu studios now that people are working out for an hour, beating themselves to death and getting rhabdomyolysis for no freaking reason. Why are we doing this? We're taking a step back. So it, it was disheartening. So I, I, this is why we did what we did. We said, we got to go proper exercise according to what we understand, like Arthur Jones. I'm going to bring Hit back. I'm going to bring Arthur Jones back. He deserves to be brought back. Because he did a lot to change the industry. I'm not saying he's perfect and everything. I'm not saying that. And it's, a lot of people have really brought in more to that. Even Ken Hodgins or um, Jim Planning. But if we listen to these guys, and we do what, what they've gone through, the experience they've done. We can build a really good business that works and makes sense. So that's where the equipment came from was from that. Yeah. Yeah. Good for you, Jeff. I think that's great. And um, let's just talk about, so again, for those who perhaps aren't familiar with the previous stuff I've done in terms of talking about what makes Imagine Strength Equipment distinct and different. Can you comment on that a little bit? Yep. Yeah, because, you know, and part of that is the fact that when you look at it, of course, Clay Steffi is, like I said, is my friend and friends for a long time. We brought him in. We were looking at building, and this is something you don't know yet. We were looking at building oh. um, a line of equipment down in, uh, out of uh, San Diego. I have a friend down there and he is very wealthy. His dad basically had a massive stroke, died from the stroke, and he wanted to build stroke rehabilitation equipment. So we, I brought Clay in to start working on that. And this is how we got to know the people that are designing it or working on our, and building our, our line of equipment. Now, they're friends of mine. They're, they're, these are good people from the factory. Um, in fact, I consider them part of my family. They're very, very strong friends. Where is the factory again? Sorry. Uh, just outside of Shanghai. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's, we just built a 120,000 square foot, brand new, two or two story, three story um, battery. We got three powder coaters, basically uh, two major powder coaters, pipe bending. I mean, this, this is a 11 robotic welders. I mean, this is a very um, high tech factory. And so when you look at our equipment, this is why it looks like it does. Um, and they, they're doing a very nice job. They, they listen very, very well. They are learning a lot from clay. Let, let, oh, I bet they are. Let's just stay on this point for a moment because this is certainly something that I think is of interest because there's been definitely issues with logistics and yep. the delivery and fulfillment of machines from, from other providers. So, um, I know, I, I, obviously, from what you're saying there, you've got tremendous scalability. So, can you talk, can you speak to, I have a global audience, we, like 80% of the listeners are, are in the US. But I do have listeners all over the world. Um, there'll be people listening to this in Europe, in Australia, um, and maybe in South America. I don't know. The list goes on. Who will be interested in the machines? So can you speak about logistically like how you would be able to cater for these businesses around the world and maybe what the plans are in terms of that? That'd be great. Well, 
as starting out as we are, as small as we are, we have a warehouse now. We yeah. have over in Idaho, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And I've got a, a partner over there, uh, Mike Teeter, who runs that warehouse and logistically runs most of that now. Because after I destroyed my spine last year, I've had to pull back a little bit. So we have him doing um, that part of it. We can build uh, over 10 lines a month, every 30 days. So we can, and we're shooting for 30. So we can fulfill quite a bit of um and a line is how many pieces? Um, right now we have 17 pieces in the That's line. Great. We're going to, we'll, you'll, we'll have probably 24, 25. We're working on three new ones right now. Um, rotary torso, bicep, tricep, actually four and a, a, a seated dip. Oh, cool. So we have, we'll cool. have four new ones here. We got to get through prototyping and stuff. I, I just got back from, from Shanghai. I just spent a week over in Shanghai last week and that was a fun trip. Uh, 22 hours each way. Oh my gosh. Oh, but anyway, <laughs> I just fit. I just was just over. The Best class though, Jeff. First, what's that? Best class, right? Be yeah. Self. Oh my gosh. But anyway, <laughs> it, it was, it was very um, valuable to go over and see the factory. So what we can do and what, what's been going on. Um, but it's the idea is yes, we can logistically, we can do smaller containers or large containers. We can build the equipment very quickly. Um, it's all now, right now, we have basically, we're building all of our jigs. So, I mean, we can literally put out equipment now correctly, you know, pretty quick. Um, and that, that, that just remains to be seen how quickly we need to do that. But right now we build anybody's need as far as that. In fact, you mentioned Australia. We have a new um, distributor in Australia, Tony Markham. And oh, we're yes. just opening up our strip. We're getting our first line to Australia and just getting it set up this, this week. Yes, no, I know that name, actually. Um, that's interesting to hear. So how does it work then? Forgive my ignorance. So you you manufacture, and I'll probably ask Clay this, and I've just forgotten, but you uh, you manufacture the machines in Shanghai, and then you ship them, what, in a big truck to the local port, um, and then they get shipped in containers, and then they go to Australia, and we'll use Australia as the example. Um, everyone listens to thinking, Lawrence, are you, are you dumb? Like... Um, and then, and then a distributor, what do they do? They, they, what do they collect the machines and then they, do they need to read what, what's their actual role? I'm trying to understand that. Just set well, with the, the location. Distributor, the equipment will come fully, it's fully bubble wrapped, you know, so it's very well protected. One thing that they've been improved over the last two years, we've been doing this for over two years with actually shipping equipment. We have some prototypes out there now in Ohio, but just got picked up, but Clay's got them. Clay just got them delivered to his house. Um, so he got our, he got some of our original prototypes. We've had them out for over two years now. So we've been doing a lot of our prototyping here, right? Well, that said is if somebody orders a line of equipment, it comes, it, it gets put together at the factory, tested, pulled apart, and then they mount the waste stacks on pallets, bolt them down, wrap them, they're protected, and then crate it. So everything's crated and protected. So when you get it, it's just a big bu bunch of boxes. So when you get to the distributor over in Australia, they're actually going to pick theirs up at the factory. So they have their own forwarders. They'll bring it over to Australia to port. Of course, they have to go through port and check them. But when they get to the, uh, either to the studio or to their own warehouse, they will uncrate them, unpack them, put them together, test them. Because, you know, with any waste stack, and I can show you on the waste stacks, maybe we'll do another podcast so I can show you a little bit more about the, the waste stacks and why we did what we did. But you have, it's a fairly precision weight stack. You want it to be correct. So you got to set them up. You got to adjust them, but that's basically it. They're already put together pretty much. You just put the frames together, put the belts up, make sure the pads are correct. You know, undo all the, uh, the padding and away you go. So mm -hmm. it's already been tested typically multiple times. I, I put in a, we're putting in the place over there, two quality control areas to make sure that they're, once they're put together, they're tested independently and gone through. So that, um, if we do ship, even though he may still have issues, you know, you always can, but we, we are looking for them. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay. That much, much clearer to me now. Um, and so uh, for latest I heard from, I think it was you, you, it was yourself or your colleague Clay, um, but you don't currently have a distributor in Europe. Is that right? Or has that changed? Um, not that I know of yet. Okay. I don't have okay. one in Europe yet. I, okay. Well, we need, we need somebody over. We, we, Gone very, very slow at this because I really wanted to make sure. No, I get um, it. Yeah. Yeah. And so it right now I think is we're at that tipping point where we can start to look for more of that. But you know, it's been really hard, Lawrence, is, is that I don't want to get very big. You know what I mean? Okay. I, I you know, I want it to be us. You know, doing this 
and talking about the equipment and actually putting it, um, you know, making change. It needs, I don't want it to be a life fitness. I don't want to be like that. I want it to be a you community know, effort. The quality. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah, we're all have an input of it. So that, and here's the thing. I always thought this makes sense. If you, if all the people out there that are buying my equipment have input on it, what equipment are they going to buy? Equipment they help build. You know, you help, our people are out there are helping us design equipment and make it better. They're going to continue to come to us to buy the equipment. Yeah. Now, if we grow, this equipment will not be going into any big, any big clubs. This is not for a plan of fitness. This is not for those kind of clubs. This is for studios. This is trainer. Um, it, this, this is trainer driven. Yeah. In other words, this equipment is driven to have a trainer. So when you have a studio, your, your clients are going to look at this and go, man, I wouldn't know how to set this stuff up. You're exactly correct. It's trader driven. It needs a technician to do it. Not that it's that hard. Don't get me wrong. But I, I want them to understand that that studio is why they need to go there because they got good tools. They got proper tools to exercise. With you. And I don't know. I don't have to worry about it. Your trainer will set it up for you. Yeah. And I think, you know, I want to go through a few of the features which have been implemented with exactly that in mind, right? Exactly the the target market, the high intensity training studio owner, um, and what they, what they want in mind. So the first thing, and I've probably not even got them all here, but you've got 18, 18 inch weight stroke, right? So you've got a longer weight travel, which means that the resistance, the same, the same amount of weight is harder. And right. that also means that you need less weight and therefore the machine is lighter, which makes it easier to move and much less expensive to produce. Is that, am I hitting all the main points there? They had in the fact that it's much shorter. So if you look at the, okay. even this is our tallest machine right here. And I'm ah. going to turn just a little bit so you can see, so you can see the row over here. The row is quite a bit short. If you look oh, at the yeah. weight stack. Okay. Well, it's, it's only we're about now, five. We're now, you got to be on YouTube now, guys, to enjoy this part of the experience. This is five bonds. You know what I mean? So that okay. keeps, the, keeps the, uh, the center of gravity down lower. So you're not having it. There's been a number of issues with different equipment where they tip over, they have a hard time moving them. That, and you have a 550, 600 pound stack. We want to, our, our biggest stack is 500 pounds, and it's only on the one. The rest of them are 400 or below. Even on our neck, it's only got a, a 200 pound stack. So we can adjust the strength curves around that to make it so that you can fit a smaller weight stack, save money. But we also wanted to be able to do tubing. So we wanted to you know, make sure that when we're building our equipment, it looks more modern it has a real nice look to it and that's what the idea with the bit tubing and it's structurally very strong that way so we have a very strong um so yes those points we have an 18 inch stroke which allows it to be heavier um and use less weight in the stack but it also allows us to not outpace the stack and there's a number of people that have asked me are, are your you know weight stacks heavy enough well we're almost one to one if you're doing 100 pounds on our machine it's almost exactly that it's about 92 pounds on most of the machines. So most of them, depending on the string curves, have a almost a one-to-one -one ratio as far as weight. You know, you're actually lifting that weight. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is unique. Yeah. In, it, in a sense. Yeah. Fast yeah. lambs. So, okay. So, Sorry, go ahead. You have another four. Well, I was going to say another thing that we did that, that we changed so we could do that is Clay came up with this new design for the waist stack. So our waist stacks are not the same as everybody else's. They are not. We have two guide rods, two selector rods. Um, that lift. So our side stack, our side stack is over here, not on top. Yeah. So our side stack's here, which allows again for the for the waist stack to be lower. Yeah. Lower center of gravity, less metal. Um, we still have a two pound increment waist stack. So as easier to from, adjust as well, right? Like you don't have yeah, to very, gap very it simple. and all that. Yeah, right down here. Yeah. And if you look, we even have anodized. Now we have blue and red pins. I love your very pins. Very nice. <laughs> Yeah, a little, they're nice. Yeah. Well, I kind of like to be able to have blue because we're now we're doing you know different color stitching, so you can match the stitching to your pin. And anyway. uh, it's a, a really nice looking machine, sir. Well, thank really you. I, um, yeah. It was, you know, what was really fun, Lawrence, and I'll go back just a little. Pardon me, you guys, but um, when I was sitting at my friend's house and I got a, a, a email with three pictures of the first three prototypes of the it was white equipment. That's our first ones, leg press, row, and chest press. And it was like, I just about cried. It was, I couldn't believe we actually got to that point where we got our first prototypes. So now when I'm sitting on these after our, our fourth 
fourth version of them and been using them for about a year here now. I mean, they've been in my studio now for about a year. Um, and that gives us a lot of information. It gives us a lot of, that's one reason why I have it first. A lot of information on how we can make them better. But it's been, I walk in here, I, I, I turn the lights on or turn the lights off and I'm leaving. I just kind of stare at everything. I go, I can't believe we did this. I can't believe it, you know, it's here. And, you know, they, I'm kind of proud of that fact that we did that, you know, and I, I like the way they look, you know, yes, you can always make improvements, but I, I'm, I'm very yeah. happy with where we're at. Let's put it that way. Jeff, I'm going to get all emotional now. And, uh, I know, huh? don't, don't, um, don't stop. No, don't, no need to apologize. I keep interjecting with these little anecdotes and stories. They're fascinating. Um, well, so I, as much as Clay has had so many years in this and he's t told me a lot of stuff, I've had a lot of years in this too. Not, not, you know, I've never got to meet Arthur. Okay. I was supposed to meet him, but I never got to meet him. And Jim decided that I probably shouldn't see him because he was so, so in such poor health. Yeah. So I never got to meet him. Now I feel like I have, you know, I've, I've, I've made good friends with Hutchins and Darden and all those. In fact, Darden was at my 25th anniversary um, when we got remarried. He was part of our, anyway. So we have pretty good history there, but that doesn't mean anything. You know, what means something to me is the fact that um, I've learned from them what proper exercise is and what, and it's actually even evolved more. And I trained eight minutes a week, have for almost 40 years. Eight minutes. Eight minutes a week. After I, two hours a day, six days a week. Now I'm, you know, now after the evolution of going through that, I'm now training about eight to 10 minutes a week. And I'm stronger now I've ever been. And I'm five foot six, wow. 63 years old, 210 pounds. I mean, I don't need to be any stronger. So I live life differently at 63 than I would had I not strength trained. And proper tools help that that allow you to do that. And that's where these have come from. From that, I want to reach everyone. My main focus is those that need to strength train. And that's all of us above 50 years old. Yeah, 100%. So look, let's, uh, let's continue with some of the points I got here. Um, talk to me about some of the changes in or, or the, the design elements of these machines. So the, the, for instance, the resistant curves, the grips, things like that. Can you just give us a few pointers on um, what, what you guys you did there? Me, or some of the machines? To, yeah, yeah to if it's comfortable the... for you, let's walk around yeah. and do it. Yeah, I'd love well, that. Just, just, as a, uh, just as an aside, so you can just kind of see up. I'm going to tip this down. Can you see the handles? Yeah, we can see the seated right handles. Beautiful. Okay. Can you see yep. it? So we now have 23 inch, 21 yeah. inch, 19 okay. inch. So we can adjust now. So, so Jeff, just uh, you're going to have to be really descriptive for the listeners. Some people are just walking their dogs or driving their cars. So yeah. just fit, just keep so that in mind when you're describing have, stuff. <laughs> what we have is we, and Clay did this. This is a very simple design, which is nice. But what it is, is it allows us to have different size widths for different clients. So we have very small women, four foot 11 to six foot eight. So you have to have a handle, but it's never been, I don't know why it's never really been done, but then adjust in and out width wise. So we have a 23 inch width, 21 inch width and a 19 inch width. So it allows us to fit pretty much any need as far as um, the client. Yeah. So they can, they can, they can pull, instead of pulling out here, you know, they're pulling very close to their body. Anyway, much more correct exercise. And then if you look at the, um, for example, here, we now have an adjustable pad. Okay. This is pad the chest pad on the seated row. Yeah. Jeff's now because adjusting the, that up. The height is here. Yeah. You know, you have some of the people that are still short. It's up in their chair. Yeah. That's a problem. This allows yeah. us to come down and adjust. Mm -hmm. We lengthen the seat down here for, um, thicker people. We have a lot more people that are you know, thick, for example, that so just, just to, sorry, just to, just to describe that quickly. So what, what Jeff was showing me there is the, the handles that you pull in the seated row, you can actually slide the handle horizontally, um, towards or away from the client. So as to basically cater for different size individuals with different wingspans, et cetera. So it works for anyone. And then it's, there's different grips as well. You've got a horizontal vertical grip oh, yes. on the seated row. Too. Have, yes. And an adjustable chest pad so that it doesn't like feel like it's punching you right in the throat, as you described. Yeah, exactly. So that's great. Yeah. And people, you know, we've had detractors that talk about the role, for example, in the chest press that, well, they're just, you know, remaking medics equipment. Well, medics equipment is wonderful equipment. And Clay, oh. designed, most, Clay designed most of the medics equipment. So, yes, there is some DNA, definite medics DNA, or, you know, but it's because the muscle and function didn't change. Yeah, it's a bit of a cheap shot, as we were still saying. 
Yeah, yeah but I mean, you know, when you, it, it's just okay. It, like, yeah, I don't. I, I expect that. I would probably say the same thing. But it's not the same machine. The strength curve is different. We have about a two to one fall off or so. We didn't go to an extreme fall off because we don't know how people want to necessarily train on. So if you get a decent fall off, you can always start to speed up a little bit if you want. If you really want to go slow, you can do your first slow rest. But anyway, we designed the equipment so you can use it. But it needs to be about a four second each way. It's still going to be a slow, high intensity training, right? It's not going to be, you know, we're blowing through it. What it's designed for. That said is, yeah. well, you can use it however you want to. But that was why we designed like this row. It still has plantar congruent movement around the shoulder. Muscle and joint function is correct. Uh, but we wanted to make it more accessible for smaller to larger people. Well, that's why the sliding handles in and out. So you have a, a 23 inch width to a 19 inch width. We needed to have that. I had so many women in my studio. I mean, they're gripping yes. they're way out here, pulling. Diverge is too far. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. So, and then they're, like you said, the pads up in your neck, you know. So those things were just, you know, typical use problems that we had. And we adjusted that so we can make the machine. And there's so a, you mentioned a fall off. So just to describe that to people who don't yeah. understand. So, yeah, one of, I guess, concerns with the row um, or the medex row is the lack of fall off in the last third, which can make that, that last kind of third of the the the, the concentric range, a part of the range of motion quite difficult when you're trying to really retract your scapula and really feel it in the back. So I noticed that when we did the workout at Rec, like that, um, yeah, the the fall off works very fall well. Off, on yeah, the fall off is better because you're, you're exactly correct. You need to be able to fully rotate those elbows back and toward the spine is that what the, mm -hmm. the lats do and you know but you're also involved in bicep learning up but that's the key is 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 getting a good fall off but not having one that's so extreme that people don't like it you know right you have to change the way they your protocols i wanted to, to fit a tool that it's a tool you use it correctly and how you use it uh, that was the idea is of course you know building building it you know uh, with a better look and design. And also now you get two different exercises. Like you talked about the two different handles, you get two different exercises on that machine instead of one. So now you have yeah. the wide grip or the narrow grip. Those kind Beautiful. Of so we're trying yeah. to look at ways to also make it more um, efficient for the floor, you know, for your training floor. Yeah. That's actually something we haven't really talked about is um, the, again, talking about how you tailored this machine business for the high intensity training studio. You've actually thought about the footprint of each machine. Yeah. Because yeah. you, you you know the average square footage of a hit studio is it's not going to be as big as like a big box gym, obviously. Yeah, they're 1,300 you, to 1,500 square feet. You should be able yeah. to start a pretty nice little studio with 1,300 square feet. You know, Some people have, have a lot less than that, though, right? Some people yeah, do this it, stuff yeah. in four or 500 even, which you could still fit your square, line. I have 1,300 uh, square feet in Lately over here, and it, I had 27 machines in it. And that's the whole point, yeah. being able to have smaller yeah. footprints allows you because you know in our in our age groups especially now my age group you have a lot of people with, with joint issues you know they come in you don't have a, so having multiple different leg exercises or chest exercises allows you to work around um debilitated shoulders or knees or whatever you have you know conditions and then people always ask why do you why do you have so many um, different types of equipment I said well one i'm sick i like equipment but <laughs> you know, i i have this disease that i've got to have but Think about the fact that, you know, there, we have so many people with bad shoulders or knees or hips mm -hmm. or whatever. And I've actually been able to, to provide proper exercise for people who could not do a typical bench press, for example, those kind of things, because we have uh, other pieces. But that's kind of what we're trying to do with our equipment. You know, we could stop 15. You know, imagine could have 15 pieces and be done. I mean, if you look at the full body, neck, abs, low back, the whole thing. But now we're going to have multiple different um, chest presses, for example multiple different um, back exercises, multiple different um, leg exercises. There's only certain things you can do around the hip necessarily, but we're going to have so that you can, you can provide a different experience for your client. Um, and that's the key thing. Uh, yeah. And yeah. that's the, uh, we know, we know that the novelty of the program, right. Having, even if the physiological like uh, change is the same, it's that experience. It's, it's, it's just changing up the workout is really seems to be important for client retention and frankly for trainers too, to keep it fun for trainers in terms of like designing workouts. Designing workouts. And this stuff doesn't get probably talked about enough, but it is important. And I love the fact that you're, you're, you're again, you're, you're speaking to that in your um, product set, right? 
which is great. Yeah. Um, so, so getting to some of that before you before you jump off of that, that's all right. Our waste stacks, every waste stack that we have on every machine is is the exact same. People go, well, how's your? How do you set up your range of motion? How do you? Because everybody has different. Well, it's all through the stack. I wanted to make it exactly simple for the tra technician, the trainer, so I can start start and stop position is in the waste stack on on all machines. So we the machines come with three pins. You have your start stop position. You can adjust it, put it wherever you want. But you can also pin it up. And start it wherever you want. So we have the holes. It's not an option. It just the holes are all the way through the whole pit. So the selector pin has holes all the way through it. I can mm -hmm. adjust this wherever I want this starting to stop position wherever. I can do static holds. I can do negatives. I can do whatever I need to do through the stack. Now the trainer now knows this, so everyone is set up the same way. So if you want to pin it up differently, you do it through the stack. And we don't have little handles to adjust or anything else. It's all done through the stack, got which it. makes it much simpler, much simpler for the trainer. And it, you've got two values either side of the plate. What are those values? There's a, uh, here you mean? Yeah. Or here. Is it, is it, it is that just pounds? And what is it's the value pounds. on the right hand side? Is it the same? It, is, it just says pounds. Okay, I thought you had it in so, kilos for us metric people there for a second. Yeah, right now, and here's the thing <laughs> what we need, and I'm glad you brought that up because I never thought about that because now that we're oh, in Australia, oh, right. we're gonna have to, they're going to have to probably come up with a second. We're probably have to change those. You're yeah. right. We're going to come up with, you know how most waste stacks have both. Well. Oh, we see. Yeah. I didn't we, know we, that. We're probably going to have to do both. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's funny because we have MedEx in our studio here in, in Galway and, uh, it's never been an issue. Like we just talk about pounds and no one seems to really care as long as the number's going up. But well, then that's all... just it. Yeah. You, you know, and when you look at most equipment and I, I have my strain gauge, I have my computer on my strain gauge uh, cart and my uh, force gauge. And I've tested a lot of, I've tested a lot of um, equipment like ours, let's put it that way. And they're about 40% of what the waste stack shows, 40 to 50%. So if you're doing a hundred pounds, you might be doing 40 pounds. People wonder why they're so strong on, yeah, on some of these equipment. That's why you, you, you aren't going to be doing that with ours. He won't be outpacing that weight stack. Interesting. So. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense because of the weight yeah. travel as well, isn't it? And let, let me ask you one more thing about, I guess, one of the key differentiators is um, I like the, the, the floating axis of rotation you've got on the leg. We call, the leg we call that the adaptive drive. Adaptive Ooh. drive. Nice, nice bit of marketing there. So, uh, well, and, yeah, it does. And I see it adapts to the joint that it's working with. Absolutely. So I can show it to you. Let me show it to you real quick. So on my leg curl it. here. For, for so example. now we're, we're going to the leg curl now, are we? Leg curl. Okay. So can you see that? Yeah, I got it. So this. Oh, just tilt one it down for me. Tilt it down for me. So can you tilt your device down? There you go. Perfect. That better? Yeah. Yep. So here's, this is the cam. Three to one fall off. So when you're doing this exercise. I want you to, can you see this? Mm -hmm. There's adaptive drive. There's a, there's what we call the adaptive drive right here. What it does, this floats. The axis of rotation floats and you can see it move. See how it moved? Okay. It only moves a little bit, but it follows the tibia bone as it travels through the joint. Okay. So for everyone listening, if you can imagine Jeff sitting on the leg curl, uh, machine and he's basically describing to me how the axis of rotation by the knee actually moves and um, it congruent with the knee as the knee uh, moves during the exercise if i'm putting it in super simple terms which is probably better for the knee and it's going to mitigate injury risk and and i guess any sort of pain that might be caused sure. by that not floating yeah we're talking about the adaptive basically what we have found during the design process was that of course very few joints in the human body are truly, you know, I don't know if we saw that or not, but if you look at the knee joint, yep. do the, you know, the flexion, the, the tibia being below the femur. Well, and that's what that joint does. So what we're, the idea is to create a uh, more safe environment for that joint. Uh, we're, we're very, I'm, I'm very much impressed and I, I re read or I listen to Bill DeSimone. You know, he's very good. And I think it's extremely important that we don't, First and foremost, do no harm. You know, we got to, it's like a doctor, we got to do no harm as far as trainers. And so what we're trying to do is design equipment around muscle joint function, but even, even more correct muscle joint function with this adaptive drive. And the adaptive drive is right now on leg extension, leg curl, and lumbar. Our low back, actually, when you look at the low back, 
when you do from flexion to extension and then spine around that, um, you actually lengthen. You lengthen by about an inch as you extend up, up and over a barrel. Well, so does our low back. So we don't have a single axis of rotation. We have a multiple axis of rotation, in a sense. So it follows the natural, natural strength curve. I'm sorry, natural curve of this movement of the spine, uh, lumbar spine. Yeah, understood. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that's awesome. I think we gave a good, pretty good overview there of um, you know what makes the the pieces quite different. There's probably some other things we we left out. Um, I thought it'd be good timing now, Jeff, to just ask you to play devil's advocate. Obviously, we would you and I were talking about some of those uh, really nice comments on YouTube uh, where people are you know saying that you know certain pieces are knockoffs of. Uh, you've touched this a little bit already, actually. Um, copies or knockoffs of Medex. Um, and how they they're not impressed by the innovation, et cetera. What what would you what would you say to to those people, those individuals? Well, first of all, I, I understand their opinion. And we're getting unstable again, it looks like. That's okay. Um, Keep going. And, and as long as you can still hear me. The uh, understand I would say the same thing. If I were seeing somebody else doing this, I'd look at it and go, Well, that looks like a you know, a medex piece. That's not we yes, we certainly have some DNA. But mainly only about five pieces that are very, very, very similar. Most of the other pieces, 12 of the 17, are complete designs of ours from the ground up. They are they, like our leg is just a leg curl, um, our pullover, our, our abduction, adduction, neck. They're not like anybody else's. I mean, you know, they are our designs. But the joints and movement have not changed. When you look at the row or the chest press, why are you going to reinvent? the wheel just to try to make it a little bit different. What we've done is redesigned the weight stack to make it different. The weight stack is completely different than, than the others, but the two guide rods, two selected rods, and that way shortens the, shortens the height and all, you know, all that we talked about. But the other ones, we've also changed how you do them for having multiple movements for the row and adjustments for the handles, the chest pad, all those things. So we've improved them, if you want to take it that, that way, to make them more useful and more accessible for a wider range of markets. Yeah, well said, well said. So Jeff, um, I actually had a question from a listener um, and they were just really curious to know, like, how do you actually innovate on a machine or decide how you're going to design a machine? I'd, I'd love, I think that this individual would really love to learn and personally, I'd love to learn too. Um, like the actual process you go through when you're designing a machine or innovating a machine, like what are the criteria and factors that you kind of have to think about? Well, first of course is the is joint function, you know, muscle and joint function and that. And of course, the, the, Arthur and Nautilus and Manix have done such a great job over the years of providing, you know, information about how that's done. What we did, of course, was um, from 20 years of using equipment, go back into what, what are we finding are the issues with our clients. Every time a client comes in, they're the different size you know, the different size ranges, whatever that allowed us to look at it, go, wait a minute. We, what happens if we had this or we had that? Like, for example, on the leg assist leg curl, I put a handle on the counterbalance. So the, it, for the trainer to help per, a person get in and out of the machine. So now you can help a person get in and out of the machine because you got a handle on it. That just came from the fact of use, you know, uh, uh, our use of experience of, of training clients constantly, you know, for, you know, for the last 24 years. So from that is how we design the equipment. What are the, it's not so much finding out the muscle and function. We, we kind of know that. What are the strength curves, the speed of movement? So the speed of movement will dictate how you build your strength curves too. You're not trying to ramp up a cam to slow somebody down. So in other words, our strength curves are much more accurate for the speed of movement than most equipment out there because the issues are we're not trying, most of our people that are buying are going to buy our equipment, train us a, a very slow or proper strength uh, protocols. Mm -hmm. These are not going to a, into a club where the public's going to be setting them up and using them. So that's another thing. That's part of the design idea is, wait a minute, wait a minute. These are trainer driven. So how, how do we want this from the outside? For example, my adduction machine, my adduction machine, the weight stack's facing the trainer. It's not facing the person on the machine. They can't even see the weight because that's how you set it up. So it's set up to, for you, the trainer, to set that person in their correct so right. those are the kind of things we go through when we're looking at. Boy, wait a minute, let's change this. Let's change that. Um, for example, on the shield, I had to make the shield wider for the hands, you know, to get in and out of those kind of things. So it's just use from a daily, daily use every day. What do we see? How do we fit more people? How do we access more of the market? Yeah. Nice, succinct answer. Appreciate it. 
And um, if someone's, let's say, this is another question I get sometimes. If someone's thinking about an imagined line, they're, they're curious, they're interested in machines, um, what, what should they buy? Let's say they're just starting out. Let's say they're just about to, you know, take out a lease on a location. You know, what, what do you think would be a good, a good amount to, to, to acquire in the first place? What do they need? Well, one of the things that we haven't really touched on, and this is one of the actually design features in a sense, is that what we wanted to do with this line of equipment was be affordable. So if you went safe, simple, effective, the lower one would be affordable. I didn't put that on there, but we wanted to, to design a line of equipment that people could actually buy and start mm -hmm. making money with without breaking the bank. So let's say on average right now, we're about $5,000 a piece on average. And I'm not afraid of that number. It's a, I think it's a dang good number for what we've been able to do. That said is you're going to have a certain budget starting off, um, 40, 50, whatever, whatever you want to spend. My suggestion is, you, um, you know, eight to 10 pieces of you starting off, you know, starting off with just a very small studio, but you're going to need, of course, your, I, I would suggest an abduction for hip, leg press, leg curl, leg extension, chest press, row, or torso arm pull down, which I would probably go, I would probably go with the row because it's easier to sit on and get on and get off. You know, you're, you're, because of the older people that we use, it's safer. They, they feel more stable to start with. I really love the pull down and I think it's easier to get on a row. For, so you have to kind of look at who you're, who are you marketing to? Who do you want in there? I expressly believe you need a neck. I'm a big fan of training the cervical spine. Keep the head above your shoulders. You have eight to 10 pounds there. It's going to be there the rest of your life. When these get weak, it's being driven to the ground by gravity. You've got to have those muscles there to keep that head up or you're going to be looking at the ground. Do you know, so on that, Jeff, I, I was listening to a podcast earlier today about some guy who's mad for like pillows, like these really fancy, expensive pillows because they get neck pain when they sleep. And I'm like, I never get neck pain, ever. Yeah. And I swear it's because I strength train. I don't know. I mean, look, I'm well, biased. Degeneration, but... you know, people forget the fact that with laws of physics, there are thermodynamics. You don't get to not play in that game. You I don't even need a pillow, Jeff. Happen. What's that? I don't even need a pillow, you know? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but you know, that's the thing is, is that you, 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 we're, we're degenerating every day. We are not strength training. And that is exercise. Strength training is exercise. Walking is, I'm going to piss a lot of people off, but I'm not a big fan of it. But doctors tell people to go out and walk because it's not going to create new bones, not going to create new joints, not going to create new muscle. So this is what we do to, to maintain that structure. You're exactly correct. You're not going to have as much pain. If you do not strength train your neck, you will because it's going to degenerate. Yeah. So, okay. No, sorry. I interrupted your flow there. So you were you passionate about them, including the neck machines in their yeah. purchase, which I understand. Yeah, in their purchase. The only be, yeah. And again, if they, it, it's not a real expensive machine, but the use you can get out of it and be able to sell from, you know, think about from the sale. You have somebody coming in and you talk to them. What are, your, what are some of the issues? Oh, we have a neck. We're going to keep you standing upright. We're not going to lose height. You're not going to get shorter. You know, you can sell these things because you're showing the benefit, all the benefits of training. Don't sell the equipment. Don't sell a magic string. Nobody cares. They don't care whether you live or die yeah, as long yeah, as you yeah. don't do it on their property. That's, so it's all about them, right? And that's what we got to be. We got to. This is why I think it's so important for all of us as trainers to understand sales. Every time that customer comes in as a sale. I, lo I love how you answer this question because you answer exactly how I would answer it. It's like, which is, it depends. It depends who your customer is. It depends on the problems you're trying to solve. I love that, Jeff. I appreciate that. And I thought you would give a good answer given your sales background. Um, yeah, I mean, the other thing as well is we, we talk about the neck machine in relation to posture, and especially for those who are sitting at laptops and computers all day long, you know? And, and, and as soon as you explain how it's going to help with you know, strength of obviously cervical spine and the posture and the neck, now it's going to help with that. It's like a really good, you know, it's a great value yeah. add. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny because I use myself a lot because I have people that come in here that know me or my age group and they're younger than I am and they're already getting shorter. I've yeah. never lost any height. If anything, I'm a little taller than I was because I, I train my spine. I train my neck, my cervical spine, my lumbar spine, my thoracic spine. I'm not getting shorter. And the only reason I'm 64 years old almost, I haven't gotten shorter is because of a little bit of eight minutes a week of street training. Yeah. Now, if you can if you can keep your life and movement and stay young, sixty four years of age at eight minutes a week, I think most of us can do that, and that's what we should be selling. These these, these studio operators, people, if you're listening, you should be selling that benefit. You're going to give life back to these people. Not only not only are they going to be stronger, but you're not taking life away. You're not taking all their time away. You're giving it back. 
Yeah. That's what you saw. We should, it's so much, I was thinking there's so much we can do in the future, Jeff. Obviously, I'd love to do more of a tour of the studio at some point, um, but also uh, stuff on sales, like your sales background. I love like sales. I really do. Yeah, it's it's just, it, I've not, apart from maybe Jim Flanagan and maybe there's a handful of others, I don't know many people who've got a strong sales background, then have built a studio and obviously have been successful yeah. growing that studio through their sales ability, you know. Uh, obviously, I have oh. a, your man after my own heart because I have a background in sales too. So I do. I, I love it because I, when I used to sell, I'll go back to this on the side because you're like this. I used to sell against course against Cybex and all the other groups. I'm going to talk about all of them. I had people paying me double, paying me twice as much to buy my Nautilus equipment because it's going to make them money. So now think about your client coming in your door. What are you really providing for that customer? Once you understand who you are, what you sell, now you sell that. Forget about your exercise. Don't even show them the equipment. They don't care. They want to know how it's going to affect them. That's all yeah. they care about. Show that. And I'm telling you what, you'll sell a lot more. Yeah, good, great, great advice. Um, yes, sell the outcome, the result, right? Yep, um, absolutely. Jeff, thank you so much for making the time today. It's been so much fun. Well, it's been fun. Right? Yeah. Unfortunately, I could go on for more, more and more. But no, yeah. it's, it's great. It makes my job very easy. Um, so for everyone listening, uh, obviously, if you want to find out more about Imagine Strength, go to imaginestrength.com and it's quite easy to find the contact details and get in touch with you and your team to and learn more about the machines. That's my cell phone number. So when you yeah. call, you'll be calling me. <laughs> that's it. It's direct to Jeff, direct line. Yeah. Um, obviously, you can also, if they want to learn about your studio business, abstractbodyworks.com. Yep. Uh, abstractbodyworks.com. And just to reiterate, remember to grab your free PDF guide on how to turn your hip business into a robust referral machine. You can download that now over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref, that's R-E-F. And you also get a full length video training with Luke Carlson on how to build a referral machine. So this is really his step-by-step -step process of doing that. Like we know that Discover Strength has been massively successful because they're so good at generating referrals. Obviously not just, that's not the only reason, but one of many reasons. Um, and you also get access to lots of free resources, including hip business guides, checklists, and much more. So you go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref, that's R-E-F. And lastly, to get the show notes for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com, search for episode 419. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. And thank you, Jeff. Thank you very, very much. I had a great time. <laughs>